So I mean, uh, the, the I think the the, the talks of uh, Olivia gave a, a, a perfect introduction for what I want to explain. And uh, I mean, what I want to explain is, uh, you know, how if we if as we think topos, okay, uh, then we shall get uh, a completely different uh, point of view, but really completely different about arithmetics. And uh, what I want to explain is how this completely different point of view on arithmetics um, uh, hinges on two fundamental problems. I mean, one was mentioned, it is a theory of motifs, and the second one is the Riemann hypothesis. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, my talk will be divided in two parts. In the first part, I will explain, I will explain if you want, the, <laughs> the path which led me and, and Katia Konsani to, uh, to the topos. And when I say which led me and her to the topos, the mental picture which I have in mind is a phrase of Grothendieck who was so upset because he was conscious of the power of what he had found. But uh, essentially, uh, nobody else was conscious at this time of the power of what he had found and he was so unhappy about it that he said, you know, that uh, it was like uh, uh, horses who were in a desertic place and there was this marvelous river and they were ignoring it. And, uh, and the river I am talking about is the river of the Topos. Now, it turns out that once you have understood the idea of the Topos, you can view things in a completely different way, <coughs> in such a different way that even a child could do it. And this is the arithmetic side. So what is the arithmetic side? The arithmetic side is a new way to think about the integers. We are used to think about the integers as an ordered ring. Uh, I want to tell you another way to think about the integers. So there is a completely different way to think about them. And uh, it's to think about them as a, a, a semi-ring topos. And uh, um, how do you change the operations? Well, a child could have done that. So a child could have come up to you and tell you, Daddy, I don't understand. Why don't you replace the addition of numbers by the supremum of two numbers? and you replace their product by their sum. Because if you do that, all the usual conditions are fulfilled. It's still true that the addition is associative, commutative. It's still true that the multiplication is distributive. Everything is, is there. Okay, and then the father would ask, yes, you can do that, but then you lose multiplication. And if the child was really amazingly clever, he would, he would say, no, I mean, multiplication is still there. It gives me endomorphisms of my object. Okay? <laughs> I mean, the child would have to be really clever, <laughs> but there are clever children. Okay? And now, now what you have is a completely new point of view on the integers. That's really amazing. That's really amazing. Why? Because now you have a geometric object. Why is it geometric? Because uh, a topos is a geometric object. It's a generalization of the idea of a space. And it's a topos which is not naked. It has a, it has a, 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 a structure shift. The structure shift is given by this semi-ring. So now the, the next question you could ask is why do you talk about semi-rings? We are so pleased with rings. Why do you have to go to semi-rings? And the answer is the following for categorical people. I mean, uh, I learned that from uh, Laurent that uh, uh, when you read in books about abelian categories, most books, in fact, tell, tell it in the wrong way. Because in most books, when they define an abelian category or an additive category, they tell you that there is an additional structure which is given, which is the addition of morphisms. A and, and that's not true. That's not the case. You don't need an additional structure. You just need to have a certain property of the category, which is written there, I don't need to go in detail into it, but if you write this property in the most simple manner, 
what you will find out is that it's not an, an additive category or an abelian category that you get, but it's a category which is called semi-additive. Namely, it is characterized by the fact that the direct sum is the same as the product. And when you have that, you have an addition for morphisms, but you don't have the minus. And you have a composition of morphisms, of course. So what you get is that, in fact, the endomorphisms of any object form what is called a semi-ring. So this means that the idea of semi-ring is even more primitive and natural than the idea, idea of a ring. Okay? And now you open the fundamental book on number theory, which is the book of André Veil, which is called Basic Number Theory, and you look at the beginning of the book. And at the beginning of the book, how does it start, André Veil? It starts by the classification of finite fields. Okay? So now you take this, you take this book and you say, oh, wow, I, now I should do it, but with semi-fields. Okay? You do it, you s spend some time, okay? and what do you find out? You find there was only one guy that was missing. There is only one semi-field, finite, which is not a field. Amazing. It's formed of 0 and 1, <laughs> okay? and, and the rule is that 1 plus 1 is equal to 1. Now, with Kadia Konsani, this is what we call characteristic one. You see, I mean, characteristic one cannot be one is equal to zero, <laughs> because otherwise you would have nothing, okay? And, but if you, if you replace it by one plus one is one, and you are not allowed the minus, then everything is fine, okay? And what do you get then? Then you get from one surprise to another surprise. The next surprise, which is absolutely amazing, amazingly beautiful, is the following is that there is a lemma which tells you that if you take a semi-field of characteristic one, so which contains this B, okay, as a sub-semi-field. Sub so if you take such a semi-field, then automatically the operation of raising to the power n is an endomorphism. Normally, when you take a finite field, you have the Frobenius endomorphism, but it's only for the power P. Here it's for all powers, and it's automatic that it's true. So for all n, you have an endomorphism, which is, a, on top of that, an injective endomorphism. It's a very worthwhile exercise to do, okay, to, to do that. So now you begin to wonder, oh my god, there is a new world there. And that's true. And that's what I'm going to explain. There is a completely new world there, okay? And uh, moreover, when you work with finite fields, you know very well that the finite fields have a beautiful property, which is that their multiplicative group is a cyclic group. Okay, so now you can ask a question. After all, there is no field, this is an exercise of two lines, there is no field whose multiplicative group is infinite cyclic. This is something which is easy to verify. But there is a semi-field, and there is only one such. And it is the one that we have to change arithmetics. Okay, so this is the one that the child had, uh, had put in. Okay. So this is the only semi-field of characteristic one. Well, not you, you don't have to require that it's characteristic one. It's the only semi-field whose multiplicative group is cyclic. It's automatically of characteristic one. There is no other choice. Okay? So that's where we are. That's where we are now. And what I want to do, I, uh, in my first lecture, as I said, I will uh, explain to you the route that we followed with Katia Konsani to the river. The river is the Topos River, which I showed you before. In the second lecture, I will show you the incredible deep and profound link that there is between this discovery of the child and the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, so this is the plan. So let's go for the trip. And uh, I mean, the trip, the origin of the trip was, uh, in fact, the previous work that Katia Consani had done and also that. Um, uh, 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 which was done about the, the local factors at the Archimedean places. Denninger had uh, uh, found a possibility, if you want to describe the local factors uh, at infinity in terms of a cohomology, which he called Archimedean cohomology, but somehow his construction was, I would say, ad hoc, and uh, uh, because he had to construct an infinite dimensional space as a cohomological space, and uh, I always had uh, the feeling that this had to be related to cyclic homology. So cyclic homology is the theory which I introduced in 1981 for the needs of a non-commutative geometry. But it turned out, and this is really the first great result that we got with Katya, it turned out that it was perfectly fitted in order to understand the uh, sort of 
manu manufactured cohomologies that Denninger had constructed. And uh, so the main result that we found with Katia is that, in fact, the, uh, uh, the SER local factors, which uses the Hodge theory, which uses, uh, you know, uh, several things, are in fact completely natural from the point of view of cyclic homology, provided you use the Adams operations. Okay, so, I mean, the way, so don't, don't, don't be worried that you don't understand the details here, because what will be important is what are the toposes which are behind, and we shall find them very, very soon, okay? So, I mean, but what is important, however, is that the motivation was to understand the local L factors at infinity, the Archimedean factors. And uh, so uh, what happened was that uh, uh, when you consider cyclic homology, it turned out that uh, there, are there is on cyclic homology, this is what discovered the fact that uh, the Adams operations exist in cyclic homology was discovered by Lode. And uh, it turned out that using these Adams operations, you can actually define the operator which had been considered by Denninger but you can define it in such a way that now it, it comes entirely naturally as the fact that when you consider the Adams operations, which normally are also given by an action of n cross of this semi-group, in fact, they combine together because the, uh, they extend, if you want, naturally to the reals, to the multiplicative group of real numbers. I, I think you can see it here. And once you extend it to the multiplicative group of real numbers, you get actually a generator for this action. And this generator will be exactly the one that you need in order to obtain the, uh, uh, the Frobenius on the cohomology, if you want, what replaces the Frobenius on the Archimedean cohomology. Uh, well, look, it's, uh, co with complex values, because it's important to have complex values when you do the calculation, okay? I mean, I mean the co complex parameter, okay? So the places can be real and complex, I mean, of course, in the, in, so you know, okay. So, so this is what you have. Now, I don't want, of course, to give you a course in cyclic homology, I mean, but uh, it's, uh, it's a theory which has, as a basic property, the fact that it exists for non-commutative algebra, and it completely subsumes the Durham theory. So it's a correct version of Durham theory in incredibly non-commutative cases. But in the commutative case, it has lambda operations. And these lambda operations have the property that they are an action of n cross, okay, of the same, if you want, monoid. They commute with the Hoch shield uh, boundary. And uh, they, they commute modulo uh, a scaling parameter with the, uh, the operator capital B, which I introduced, which replaces the, the RAM boundary. Okay. So once you have that, you, you, have, uh, you use a result of uh, Weibel, which uh, relates, if you want, the Hodge theory with the uh, uh, cyclic homology of projective varieties over C, and, uh, and uh, you obtain the Archimedean cyclic homology. I don't need to give details, as I said, I just want to give you an overall picture. You obtain, naturally, the Archimedean cyclic homology. Okay, but what, is, what are the toposes behind this story? Well, it turns out that, uh, you know, when I uh, defined the cyclic homology in uh, 81, I very quickly found by, uh, I, uh, first of all, I found that by doing, uh, you know, very complicated calculations, calculating days and days after days. And uh, once I had calculated for days and days after days, I realized that there was something which was always the same. And I tried to say there is a kind of clockwork behind my calculations, which is always the same. And I discovered that this clockwork, which was behind all the calculations, was in fact a small category, which I call the cyclic category, lambda. Okay, so it's a small category, lambda, and uh, I, I will tell you very soon what it is, this category, in concrete terms, but it extends a category which already, I think, Olivia mentioned, which is the, the uh, usual simplicial category, and uh, the lambda operations actually give you an extension of the cyclic category. Now, it turns out, very surprisingly, that if you want to explain in simple terms what is a cyclic category and what is the epicyclic category? It's a story of characteristic one. And I find this very, very uh, pleasing, you know. So what is it? What is a cyclic category and what is the epicyclic category? So they are both small categories. And of course, they have a corresponding pre-shift topos. And this pre-shift topos will be playing a fundamental role. So, I mean, uh, uh, what is it? They are obtained by doing linear algebra over the semi-field Zmax. The two categories are obtained by doing linear algebra over Zmax. So when you do linear algebra over Zmax, what do you find? You find that there are 
natural modules over Zmax, which plays a role of finite dimensional vector spaces. And how are they obtained? They are just the same Zmax, but you act on it by uh, restriction of scalar. So you act on it by this Frobenius FRN. Now, uh, when you do that, you find out that the projective space is finite. So you find the corresponding projective space is finite. And you find that the submodules are in bijection with subsets, so you are very close to the category of finite sets. And, uh, and, uh, okay, and you find uh, the rank. Okay. And now, what, uh, uh, when, you, when you look at ordinary projective geometry, you look you know, if you look at books of a standard uh, old-fashioned uh, uh, with axioms, projective geometry, and so on, you'll find out that uh, uh, the morphisms in projective geometry are given not necessarily by maps which can be lifted to linear maps, for instance, but, but, but you can relate projective geometries which correspond to different fields. Prov what you need only is a morphism of fields. So these are called semi-linear maps. Okay? These maps are semi-linear in the sense that they are not linear, but they, they satisfy the condition that f of lambda x is sigma of lambda times f of x. Okay? And uh, still, they define morphisms of corresponding projective spaces. Now, the amazing result is the following result that we proved. What is uh, sigma? Sorry? It's uh, the, the image by uh, the endomorphism sigma. So uh, sigma is a map from one field to another. Otherwise, you couldn't relate you know, the two different fields. Okay? So what we proved with uh, Katia Konsani is that the epicyclic category, which is the most fancy one, which, uh, which is the one which has the Adams operations, okay, uh, is in fact canonically isomorphic to the uh, category of projective geometry over the max. Okay? So uh, now what happens, of course, is that because you have this endomorphism, you will have a map to the topos n cross, okay, automatically. And the cyclic category is simply the subcategory which has the same object, but where the morphisms are just induced by linear maps, no twist. Okay? So now you get a picture. You get a picture. And the picture is that uh, you have uh, uh, so, uh, so you take projective geometry and two projective geometry over these various uh, uh, gadgets, you know, will correspond a, a small category. The simplicial category will correspond to the linear over B. The cyclic category will correspond to linear over Z max. And the epicyclic category will correspond to semi-linear over Z max. Now, uh, 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 what does it mean? Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, what does this mean? This means that now uh, we have understood at the combinatorial level what was uh, the, the structure that was associated to, for instance, an, an arithmetic variety. And uh, the structure which is associated to an arithmetic variety will be a, mod um, a sheaf, if you want, of abelian groups over if you would take the Hox shield, it would be the simplicial. If you take the cyclic homology, it will be this category lambda. And if you take the cyclic category with the lambda operations, it will be this epicyclic category. Okay, so that's where we are. Now, it turned out that, uh, okay, one could think, if you want, that this uh, understanding of the cyclic category, the cyclic category is known since uh, 1982. I mean, I published it a little later. Uh, and uh, 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 what was, quite amazing, in fact, about this category. You, you see, you know very well that if you take the simplicial category, it's not the same as the opposite category. Well, this is pretty obvious because you have, a, you know, you have a, okay, you have a final object uh, which is not initial. Okay, now, uh, the, the cyclic category, I discovered by doing calculations that it was self-dual. This is very surprising, you know, this is extremely surprising. It's an extension of the simplicial category by cyclic groups for each n, but it is self-dual. And uh, how do you under understand this from the point of view of uh, this interpretation? Well, you understand it because there is a duality, I mean, of vector spaces, the, the one we consider. So if you have a, a morphism, you can transpose the morphism, and of course, I mean, you get the same category. <laughs> so this you get for no price, okay? So you understand this property. The second property, which plays a crucial role in the definition of the Adams operations, is what is called the cyclic descent number. Uh, it's the fact that uh, uh, any permutation can be obtained as a projective transformation associated to the, epi to the epicyclic category, but there is a smallest module for which it can be obtained, and this is the cyclic descent number. So this is a technical point. But now we come to topos, 
And we come to topos because when you work with the lambda operations, okay, you find that there is a topos, and this topos is uh, dual. So here, when I take dual, I, I am already putting the opposite. Eh? So in fact, uh, I am talking about covariant functors, okay, <laughs> from the epicyclic category to sets. So this is a topos. And, uh, and uh, an epicyclic module now is a covariant functor from the epicyclic category to the category of abelian groups. Now, uh, uh, Olivia mentioned in her class, of course, that when you have a topos, you have a corresponding cohomology theory, okay? And uh, it turns out that the, uh, the, the Adams operations on the cyclic cohomology is exactly that cohomology theory obtained for this topos, which is amazingly simple. You know, in the, in the compte rendu note which I had published about the cyclic category, I had shown that cyclic homology was an next functor uh, in, uh, with respect to, the, to this category. But of course, with the topos, it's even better because why is it better with the topos? Let me explain this because this is, this is what convinced me. You see, because at the time, I had computed the classifying space of the cyclic category. I published it in my note. And I had found that the classifying space for the cyclic category is P infinity of C. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a KZ2, if you want. It's a, so, so this is what I had found. But uh, uh, <laughs> then I, I was happy by understanding that the S operation, the periodicity operator in cyclic homology, was corresponding to the fundamental two-dimensional cohomology class in P infinity of C. Fine. I was happy with that. But then, after a while, you realize you cannot be happy with that. Why? Because if you take the simplicial category, and you compute its classifying space, <laughs> it's a point, <laughs> okay? So, okay, because it has this final object. So, so it's ridiculous to look at the classifying space. The classifying space is wasting, is losing an enormous amount of information, not the topos. The topos keeps all this information for you. So the topos is a geometric object, like the classifying space, but it's a geometric object which remembers faithfully what you started from, so that you can do cohomology and not having lost any detail about the cohomology. So this convinced me about the topos. This is the exact point which convinced me that the topos was the right idea. Okay? So then when we talk about topos, okay, when we think topos, as I said from the beginning, uh, we, 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 we find that there is this epicyclic site and uh, what we find is that when we have uh, now an epicyclic module, we have the lambda operations, they define an action of n cross. So now our, our n cross is reappearing here, okay, on the cyclic homology group H C star of E. And uh, what you find out actually is that when <laughs> the epicyclic module that you have constructed factors through fi the category of finite sets, which is simple case, okay, then you have a decomposition into integral weights. But this is not the case in general. And in fact, <laughs> what happens is that you have epicyclic modules which can have arbitrary complex numbers as weights. And this comes from the fact that you can twist them, for instance, by Dirichlet -like characters. Because Dirichlet -like characters are precisely, if you want, uh, uh, morphisms from the n cross to the complex numbers. So now, now we have uh, 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 found and uh, Olivia was uh, uh, involved with uh, Venslav in uh, finding a, a much better proof than uh, the what we had done with uh, Katia. I mean, uh, but uh, we had found a theorem about computing the points of the epicyclic topos. Because, of course, if you have a topos, the first thing that you should do is to compute its points. So, I mean, we were able to do it uh, with Katia. And uh, uh, what we found is that the points were best expressed in the geometric language in characteristic one. So it turned out that uh, the, the category of points was given by algebraic extensions, but when I say algebraic extension, I mean abstractly. I don't say how oh, the max is inside. I just say that K, okay, as abstractly, is an algebraic extension. And, uh, and then you take a semi-module over this, and, uh, okay, and, and, you, and the morphisms are projective classes of semi-linear maps, once again. Now, uh, uh, as I said, our proof, well, our proof was lengthy and complicated. I mean, it was, uh, it was a very tricky uh, argument, but okay, it was the first proof. And then it turned out that by the general uh, machine of topos theory, okay, I mean, uh, <laughs> Olivia and Venslav were able to you know, I mean, uh, I, I always pray that somebody finds another proof of some result which I have found. 
because uh, I, I, I have an habit which is to wake up at three o'clock in the morning and worry about some lemma which I proved or something. So, so I mean, here, here, here it was a, a complicated proof. So it was great that exactly what Olivia explained, namely the, the, the objects which are finitely presentable and so on. Had a, it, it is a key idea which allowed to really simplify the argument which we had. Okay, and so if you want, uh, now the relation is the following. So now we have discovered already three toposes. Okay, so there is a topos which corresponds to the cyclic category. There is a topos which corresponds to the epicyclic category. And there is our original topos, the topos which is the dual of n cross. Okay, and there is this, of course, this exact sequence. Okay, I, I, I don't want to formulate it in fancy way, but I mean, this is an exact sequence, and uh, there is a conjectural role now that I want to explain on the role of the cyclic homology uh, uh, with respect to uh, uh, end of lambda operations, if you want, with respect to motives. So this is what I, I want to try to explain in some detail, okay? And uh, I mean, uh, uh, so what is the idea behind that? The idea is that uh, uh, somehow, you know, this uh, the above exact sequence uh, so it gives a, a geometric morphism which goes from the, uh, the topos which is dual to the epicyclic category and the topos which was the base for the arithmetic site. And uh, somehow, you know, the kernel of this, I mean the fibers if you want, the fibers correspond to the cyclic category. So how should we understand the theorem that we had proved with Katya how should we understand this original theorem about the L factors of Ser, the Archimedean L factors of Ser? So the idea is that one should understand this theorem by saying that, uh, uh, you know, it's by integration over the fibers. So, I mean, uh, so if you want, you have this, okay, so you have a, you have a geometric picture where you have the, uh, you have the epicyclic topos, okay, and you have, you have this n, n cross at, okay, which is the arithmetic side, I mean, except I, I want to put the structure shift, of course, so I, okay, this is the underlying space to the arithmetic side, okay, and, and, then, and then you have the fiber, which is the cyclic, okay, which is uh, the dual of the cyclic category. Okay, now the idea is the following. The idea is that when we do that, that theorem, we are taking, in fact, the cyclic homology, okay? And, and then we are doing, we are looking on the cyclic homology to the action of the lambda operations. So we are, we are taking the cyclic homology groups and then we are looking at the lambda operations. But what is the geometric picture? The geometric picture is that, you know, after all, the arithmetic variety gives us by uh, its completion at uh, the Archimedean places, it gives us, uh, um, it doesn't give us um, a sheaf on the epicyclic topos, but it gives us an object in the derived category of sheaves. The reason is the following. The reason it gives us a complex of sheaves because when you compute the uh, cyclic homology, you localize using the church complex. So this gives us an, an element in the derived category. So it gives us a, 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 a complex of sheaves, okay? gives us a complex of sheaves on the epicyclic topos. And uh, somehow, you know, what happens is that by taking the cohomology of this complex of sheaves, namely taking the cyclic cohomology, then you get something here on the arithmetic side. And it is what you get here which gives you the local L factors. So I it is what you have downstairs on the uh, epicyclic side, on the cyclic, uh, uh, so on arithmetic side, which gives you what you need in order to compute the local L factors. This is extremely pleasing from the geometric point of view, but now you can ask, okay, you gave some interpretation at the Archimedean place, what about the other places? Of course, this is a fundamental question. If we want to go anything global, okay, we are, we are stuck with that. And it turns out that, uh, it turns out that there is a beautiful answer to that <coughs> question. Okay, there is a beautiful answer to that question, and uh, the answer is, uh, is the following. The answer is the following. It turns out that uh, uh, people working in, uh, in spectra, uh, like uh, Goodwilly, uh, Madsen, uh, SLOLT, many people, have uh, developed an analog of the cyclic 
theory, an analog of the arc shield first, which they call topological arc shield theory, and an analog of the cyclic uh, theory, which they call topological cyclic theory. And uh, it turned out that when you use this theory, so I will tell you a little more, it turns out that when you use this theory, you, you can compute, this was done by Lars Esselholt recently, it's a recent paper of Lars Esselholt, I will show you the reference. It turns out that you, again, you have the same theorem as we proved with Katya for the Archimedean place, but now it's a theorem about finite places. Okay, it's a theorem about finite places. So it's a theorem which computes the local L factor of an arithmetic variety, okay? But it computes it uh, using crystalline because what is hidden behind this formula is crystalline cohomology. And uh, what Esselholt and Madsen have shown in magnificent series of papers is that crystalline cohomology is subsumed by cyclic theory. Okay, and in fact the Fontaine theory is also uh, uh, included in the general operations of cyclic theory. What you have to do, which is a <laughs> very non-trivial step, is that when you do all these calculations, you are no longer working in characteristic zero. You are no longer working over C or working over QP or something like that. You are working over a universal base, which people know in the theory of spectra, and uh, uh, which is called the, the, the S algebras, so the sphere spectrum. You are in fact working over the sphere spectrum. Okay. But uh, uh, somehow what is amazing, what is quite amazing, is that then you have a completely unified uh, point of view about the local L factors. And... Uh, 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 what do you mean by working over spectrum? Well, okay, uh, we have a paper with Katya in which, you know, if you try to read papers on spectra, you stop after uh, half a day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let me repeat, okay? <laughs> you know... If you, if you try to, to learn the theory of spectra, okay, after half a day of reading, you stop. Why? Because for many years, this theory was developed without uh, 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 the product being associative on the nose. It was only associative up to homotopy. So it's a real headache. It was a real headache until the end of the 90s, when it was discovered that there was another way to formulate the same theory, okay, but with a theory of uh, smash product, I mean with a theory of the product of spectra which is associative on the nose. And the best understanding of that was existing already before. It is a theory of Seagull's gamma sets. I don't want to enter into it. It's a very simple theory, it's beautiful theory. And what we did with Katya was to summarize this to explain how spec Z can be endowed with a structure shift of S algebras, sphere spectrum algebras, and so on. And this somehow, you know, puts the theory which was first invented by Durov on a much better footing because it's workable. Everything is workable and so on. So, so what I want to say now is that when you apply my definition of cyclic homology for S algebras, you get topological cyclic homology. Okay? And, uh, and but then, uh, as a bonus, because you are working with S algebras, which are the smallest base you can imagine, okay? The it's a base over any other base, even, uh, even this B, it's, it's over S, okay? Even the B, which I mentioned, it's over S. Everything you know, the base, I remember uh, an Oberwolfer meeting in 1988, where uh, uh, Goodwillie was there. And Woodgooley was trying to explain to everybody that the true base <laughs> is not Z, but it's uh, the sphere spectrum. I mean, at the time, you know, people didn't listen too much to him, but it's, it's really true. It's really what it is. Okay. Now, wha what happens, what do you gain when you work over the sphere spectrum, which is amazing, is that now the cyclic permutations, you know, if you take the permutation in A times A, X times Y goes to Y times X, what do you know about the fixed points? Nothing. What is the fixed point of this operation? I mean, you don't know. It's not A, because there are many, many tensors, you know, <laughs> which are fixed and which are not in A. But when you work with the sphere spectrum, it's A. And from that, you deduce an abstract definition of the Frobenius, characteristic P and so on. And this is what these people have done. So, so it's, it's a remarkably uh, amazing fact that now there is a unified way of formulating the local L factors and uh, with Katya we have, uh, we have uh, uh, manufactured uh, uh, a topos 
because both this construction, the construction of the epicyclic is ov obviously on the arithmetic side. The construction of these people, uh, of uh, uh, Esselot, Madsen, uh, uh, Dundas. Dundas plays a very important role. Dundas, Goodwillie, and McCarthy. They have a book, a beautiful book on algebraic case theory, which uh, explains all that. Uh, it, it's also a category which is, uh, which is above the arithmetic side. So what we have done with Katia, we have combined these two. We have not published this. We have this since several years because we want to make sure that we get the right notion into a, a category, so a topos, and, uh, and uh, the conjecture uh, we are ready to make is that there is something which is very, very, very close to an effective type of theory of motives, which would be the theory of the derived category of S module on this pericyclic topos. And uh, in, in the sense that when you have an arithmetic variety, you can associate an object on that. And that object captures essentially, we believe, all the cohomological information that you need. And uh, you know, so, so this is very tempting. But OK, of course, this is at the level of conjectures. So is the yes. topos also a Yeah, everything there is a pre-shift pre topos. Everything there is a pre-shift topos, OK? Everything there is a pre-shift topos. And uh, so let me now uh, uh, end the first lecture by giving you some bibliography. OK, so I mean. Uh, 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 with Katia, we, we, we started, I mean, okay, we have other papers before, but I mean, somehow, the paper which is most related to the uh, both inspirations from her on the cell local factors and uh, from cyclic homology on my side is this paper. And then we have these two papers about the uh, cyclic and epicyclic sites and projective geometry and characteristic one. So for now, if you want, what we have seen in this first lecture is that uh, 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 there is this... Uh, uh, dominant role of the, how to say, of characteristic one. I mean, uh, it's quite amazing that somehow the <laughs> cyclic category and the all the and this epicyclic category. I mean, if I had had to define for you by generators and relations the cyclic category, <laughs> you would have felt the same thing as for. Uh, uh, you know, spectra and things. I mean, you know, you don't want to see something like that. I mean, <laughs> okay. And and there is indeed a very concrete work to do, in the sense that uh, uh, okay, um, uh, for the simplicial category, one knows that the simplicial category is the the simplicial topos, if you want, which is dual to the simplicial category, is the classifying topos for the theory of intervals. Okay, so in other words, uh, it, it's a very simple geometry uh, theory, the theory of totally ordered sets with a minimal element and a maximal element, which are distinct. I mean, you know, this is a very, very simple theory. Now, uh, uh, Mordaic had uh, written a paper in which he had uh, uh, characterized the, um, uh, the dual of the cyclic category as the classifying topos for what he called abstract circles. But this corresponded indeed to the intuition that I had, namely that, you know, you, you, it's of course the circle is not totally ordered, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you have a kind of partial order, you know, which, which goes around and so on. So he had, he had done that. Now, the, the, the what we obtained with Katia in our theorem, the in the theorem which I mentioned before, okay, I mean, what we had obtained in this uh, uh, characterization here, uh, 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 for the well, I, because it also goes for the it, it also goes for the cyclic category. But for the cyclic category, you don't take an algebraic extension; you just take the max, and the morphisms are linear maps. Okay, so in that case, in that case, what I would suggest uh, is the following: is that the relation between the characterization of Mordaic and the characterization we got, and that you got also. Uh, is exactly the same as the link between MV algebras and uh, the lattices. And the reason is the following. The reason is that the characterization of Mordaic is really finitistic. Whereas the when you talk about these semi-linear Archimedean modules and so on, uh, eh, you know, so there is some very nice work to 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 do in that respect. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and of course the same holds for the for the for the epicyclic category. So the same, the same story holds, of course, for the epicyclic category. So, so th okay, so then, as I said, there is a paper of uh, Olivia and the Venslav, okay? And, uh, and, and then uh, 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 there is this paper. Uh, so this is the paper in which we describe the role of S-algebras. 
And we explained that the structure shift of spec Z is a structure shift of S algebras. And this corresponds at the Archimedean place to the convexity notions. So it turns out that it, it fits exactly with the type of uh, things that people have, have been considering. So, and there is now a paper of SL Holt which has just appeared, uh, uh, which gives the, uh, the topological oxidomology and the Acevel zeta functions. So, I mean, but okay, so this is the I exactly the one in which uh, he has uh, this, uh, this uh, 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 theorem here. Okay, so I, I went a little bit fast, perhaps. But I think I, I said what I wanted to say for the, for the first lecture, okay? And um, uh, depending on your mood, either I stop now or I start already the second lecture because it will be tough to go on the second no, lecture. We have the coffee break. Let's take the coffee break, okay? <laughs>